Today, I will share on a topic that is close to our parenting hearts. A topic that brings about a myriad of emotions and perspectives. Yes, let's get talking about education. Today, we will not be focusing on the merits or the troubles with our system. Instead, we will look at the role we as parents can play in the educational experience of our children. Please indulge me for a while to reflect on the scenario I am sharing. Imagine this. An adult developmental guideline. At age 35, you must be able to code a computer program, whether you are keen to or are able to. Your spouse thinks you may want to do better in the job and signs you up for courses after work. After all, the market is very competitive. We may find this far-stretched, but this is what our kids face. They are told that they must be able to read by a certain age. If not, something is wrong and this age is getting lower and lower. Parents, well-meaning as we can be, sign them up for an array of classes which they may or may not be coping with. Many of us sincerely want our children to have a positive learning experience, but we do worry about performance indicators such as grades. In addition to school performance, we are told that grades alone are not enough. Our kids need to have more and we as concerned, invested parents try and send them to highly valued learning such as music, STEAM, STEM, robotics, coding, and the list goes on. Where I am getting to with this is, as parents, we desire what is best for our children. Our intent is born out of love for the child. But have we made the child part of the very equation of which they are a key component. Can we then be more intentional about this? I am not encouraging a situation where we as parents allow a free reign for the child to make decisions that have significant impact on his future. But rather, do we let the child lead us in helping us shape his educational journey and experience? There aren't any formulas out there. In fact, social media and the industries benefiting are not making it easier for us parents. It can be really noisy, with various voices clamouring to influence us. But I do hope that the pointers I have brought up can serve as a springboard for reflection and discussion in your home. Now, I will share how I approach education for my children. I have four young ones, aged 9, 5, 3 and 9 months. I am currently homeschooling my preschooler. I homeschooled my 9-year-old till the end of primary 2 when she then expressed desire to join a mainstream school. My husband and I try our best to take a whole child approach to educating our children. We try our best to look at the emotional, social, spiritual and academic needs of a child in an integrated manner when we plan or make decisions. This approach aims to ensure a child feels safe, engaged, supported and challenged. A mantra I keep reminding myself is, I cannot change the system. However, I have the power to change the kind of experience my children will have in their educational journey. Hence, I prefer a holistic approach to learning versus the traditional test-centric, standardized form of teaching and learning. This approach is more of a mindset than a method. I will share some of the principles behind this mindset which I have found helpful. Firstly, we choose to value outcomes other than quantifiable ones such as grades so that it enables us to foster a spirit of relaxation and curiosity when approaching academics. I share with my kids 
that the score only reflects how much they have understood at this point. It does not define their ability in a subject matter. These scores can be improved through various means. This promotes a growth mindset and helps them to approach life with a more problem-solving mentality. It also helps to stop the child from feeling like, I can't do this, or I'm lousy at this. When we are not outcome-focused, we feel less stress, and the kids will feel it too, and begin to enjoy learning. My girl is mildly dyslexic, with a slightly weak working memory, so spelling can be a challenge. Memorising or the usual methods didn't quite work for her initially. I had to find a method that worked with her versus trying to get her to cope with the standard methods of learning spelling. I also had to work on her emotional state. I shared with her that her brains are wired differently and we will work together to help her, help herself to learn spelling. Fast forward to these days, she has spelling tests. I encourage her to make stories around the letters in the word to aid retention, especially for sight words. We practice and I remind her to do her best and that is really enough. The test scores do not indicate her intelligence or her potential. It tells us what we need to do. We take it as a feedback. I also remind her that just because we worked hard, not everything has to turn out fine. I am glad her teachers partner with me and share similar belief systems. So when she first started spelling, the teacher knowing her situation told us to focus only on the words tested as opposed to the 10 words in the list. These days, she is able to master 8 out of the 10 words. My girl and I often talk about how she has grown in this area and how she feels. In our chats, I constantly tell her that the end outcome while relevant isn't the most important thing. The process, the journey and the experience are key. I feel for kids to develop into lifelong learners with the right disposition to learning, we as parents need to be curious about the way they think. So, for example, when my kids solve a math question and show me their answer, I will tell them I'm keen to know how they solved it and how they approached it. I do this even if the answer is right. Sometimes I could have approached it differently and arrive at the same answer. This leads to many interesting conversations in our home. When I observe them working at a problem or learning something, I like to look at their expressions. It often tells me how they struggle through some of it if they like productive struggle, or if they give up easily. I then ask them to share the process with me, rather than be solely concerned about the answer or the outcome. The next aspect I try to be intentional about is to make their learning as relevant to their lives as possible, not just what is tested. This helps them to stay engaged. We can decolonize the learning experience for our kids. As a parent educator, I try to behave in a manner where I am not the person in charge. It's their learning. I give them autonomy where possible. I let them follow rabbit trails because I believe learning happens all the time. The meta layer of learning is very important to me. I also support them to pursue what they are interested in rather than to be very concerned about just preparing for exams. So for example, my girl is now keen to try to write a story. Of course, that would mean that she would be spending a good amount of time trying to put the story together rather than practicing writing compositions which may have direct relevance to her school results. From a young age, we show them how the various subjects are relevant to our daily lives. The concepts or information that is taught, it is not just for use during examinations, but 
they have direct relevance to our lives. So for example, we need to know how to count things. We need to know how to measure before we can buy, say, a cabinet. We need to understand fractions to bake. We can make use of many opportunities in our daily lives to teach about science as well. For example, when we take a walk outside and we notice the roots of a tree, we can talk to them about the function of roots. Or if we see a tree bending towards a certain direction, we can talk to them about why this is happening. This helps to keep them engaged and make learning relevant to their daily lives. It helps to keep them motivated and to know that these subjects are wider than their textbooks. It helps to keep their wonder. This makes them naturally curious and interested. The third principle that I try to adhere to is to remember that the child is the map. For us to be able to influence their educational journey, we need to know our children. We may have often heard that there aren't manuals to raise children, but we do. The child is the manual. The child is the map. And that has been so liberating for me. I have had the opportunity to read about Montessori and attachment parenting, which have always exhorted, follow the child's lead over the years, I have read some parenting books and these authors share about how to parent. Whilst these have been helpful, I find it most useful to observe my children and each one is unique. To support our children, we need to focus on them, keep our eyes on them and not just on the educational landscape around us. It's a moment-by-moment -moment parenting not a plan X for a child. To do this, we need to move away from labels, curriculums, and to the child. We navigate the educational landscape according to the child, to the map she gives us. I find this changes the tone of our relationship to education and to our children. This has been life-changing for me. When we observe our child and work with them, we would ensure a child feels supported and not left struggling in deep waters or trying to fit into something. Even when we don't get it right, we can celebrate the process and try again. In this way, the child feels supported and learns resilience to face failure. Such educational outcomes, to me, are far more important. The educational landscape tells us that by the age of five, a child should be able to do X, Y, etc. It is easy to get trapped in this mindset. Just having a chat with another parent about their kids and the classes they attend can cause us to worry. I need to remind myself to look at my child to understand what she needs. As parents, it is easy to fall into worry worry about entry requirements, timelines, or even the latest fads. But what is more productive in my view is to observe how the child thinks, how she learns, what topics are they interested in, how do they process information, what struggles they face in learning something, and then work this out. When I was homeschooling my first child, I was teaching her to read. So I used Montessori phonics. I got myself equipped and the materials. I was very excited about using Montessori, which is great. But when I tried teaching my girl phonics, it didn't work. And I was so adamant that this should work. So I hired a Montessori phonics tutor for her. My girl kept telling me how she could not handle it. But I could not bring myself to shift. It is such a great method. And why isn't my child not benefiting from it? Needless to say, I pushed her harder. She was overwhelmed and frustrated. I was upset and feeling helpless. This is my story of how I failed to read my child, despite the tears and what feedback she gave me, causing her to get anxious about reading. 
It took me a while to stop this and take a break for both of our sakes. Homeschooling afforded this at that time. And when we were both less stressed, I observed her. I saw signs that she may be dyslexic. I got her assessed and we found her to be mildly dyslexic. I had to see what worked for her and what did not. But this approach of checking in with her, following a lead and observing her, this change helped her feel supported and she experienced the sweetness of success eventually. But more important than reading, I feel, is the connectedness she felt to me. It's a building of relationship which I find hard to describe. I realize now that the method must suit the child and not the other way around. Now, her teachers hardly notice she's dyslexic. During that period, we stopped focusing on math and mother thumb to give her the space and time to focus on reading. Because I realized that picking up a skill like reading can be challenging and tiring for her mind, I didn't want to pile on more. I trusted that when she could read, we can take on other subjects. And this worked out really well. When we truly drop following a timeline, we allow our children to be human. We give them time and space. Learning cannot take place in a rush or in a pressure cooker mode. I have found constant checks such as, do they need external help? Do they need more time? Do they need the space to focus on one area of learning, leaving the rest aside for a while? Are great tools for me. Currently, my daughter is in school. Besides homework requirements, which are few for now, I am constantly reminding myself we are not joining the red race. To know the child and read his or her cues, we need to spend time with them. Involvement is key. Children are very perceptive if we have an agenda to get them to talk or if we are keen to hear them and are genuinely curious about them. Spending time doing things they are interested in or just chatting with them about things that matter to them helps to foster an environment of openness and willingness to share. And we can bring that to education as well. If they face a roadblock in learning, I tell my daughter that I'm keen to hear her input about how we can go about this. I like to give her a voice and at the same time to get her to think through solutions. Talking to the children, observing them, being curious about their thinking, ideas and opinions helps us to get to know them better. During these conversations, I try my best to withhold judgments. These conversations give me opportunities to also share with her any concerns I may have for her. For example, I could share with her that at some point, you need to learn your times table. Let's see how we can go about it and how it may matter to the things you care about. Spending time can be so challenging for many of us. We come with different circumstances, such as work from home, double hatting at home as one spouse may have a demanding career, multiple kids, etc. For me, with the birth of my fourth one and meeting his needs has meant I get lesser time with the rest. This did make it difficult for me to know what they are going through. So, yes, I spoke to other mums to bounce ideas on how to be creative in carving out time with the other kids. For now, we read together, play some games and have chats while I feed the baby. Knowing and meeting emotional needs leads to a feeling of safety and trust. So spending time building relationship is important to help our children face the challenges that may come with learning. This is so vital to the well-being of any child, which then helps them navigate the stresses of daily life and education. I have to do daily temperature checks and scan my home to get a pulse of how my children are feeling, what they are going through. Are they seeking attention? 
Their behaviours give us subtle cues. Children are generally willing to share if they feel respected and if they have the language to do so. My older girl is very articulate and self-aware about her emotions and is willing to share. My boy, who is five, however, lacks the language and he does not seem to like to talk about his feelings as much. So now I try and give him a set of colours, with each colour representing a feeling, and tell him to shade his heart. This helps to serve as a springboard for him to open up. A child who feels loved, accepted and respected will find his or her giftings, if not now, someday. The schools will ensure content is tested and concepts are mastered.